uh, I'd like to introduce uh, David Lord Bresso, a performance engineer at SUSE. He's done a lot of great work on scaling and performance for the Linux kernel, and he'll be giving a talk on Futex scaling. If you've had to implement user space primitives for synchronization that involve blocking, then you've probably built something on top of Futex's. So da David Lord will take it from here. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, yeah, this talk is about um, Futex scaling on, on multi-core systems. Um, I work for, for SUSE, mainly doing um, all kinds of performance work in, in the Linux kernel. Um, and Futex is definitely one of those things that I keep coming back to um, time and time again because there's always the need for um, better performance um, at both user space and, and kernel space. Um, but this talk is mainly about uh, kernel space, but there's also going to be some some pointers on how to make um, u better use of them um, when, when you're actually building the, the primitives. Um, I've divided this, this presentation in, into three parts. The first is a probably a necessary introduction to, um, so that we're all basically on the same page as to what actually Futexes are. Um, we'll see some examples. Um, then we'll go much, much uh, more into the implementation in, in kernel space. We'll see the overall architecture, um, and then based on this architecture, we'll see what kind of bottlenecks are presented on, on real systems. None of this is, is theor I mean, it, it's theoretical, but all these problems um, have been in, either in bug reports or hallway conversations with uh, people making use of them. So um, finally, we'll see about better practices or what to do or what not to do when um, using Futexes in, in user space. Um, Futexes were introduced around 2002 for the um, 2.5 kernel. Um, and it's basically a functionality for user space to implement um, fast mutual exclusion. Um, it's through the, the system call. Um, and if you read the man page and all, it, it, it'll mention that um, in, in essence, it's a method to wait um, for, for a, pro a process to wait um, for a given ver uh, value um, on, on a specific address to change. And um, at the same time, it's a method to wake up any blocked process on a specific address. So when, when we talk about futexes, we're actually talking about just a user space address, and particularly a 32-bit uh, address. As we've, have, as we've been, been mentioning, um, Futexes lend themselves very well to uh, build higher level locking abstractions. Um, and th if you use Linux, you'll see that the, the primary example of this is um, through POSIX uh, three threads, such as implementing um, mutexes, read write locks, um, barriers, um, conditional waiting, um, convars, you name it. Um, but when you're also developing a specific application, um, it is not uncommon to use Futexes directly to build your own locking primitives because there are um, issues with pthreads or you might not want to be uh, sharing the address space, you want, want to be using processes. Um, and typical scenario you'll, you'll see if you um, run into to Futexes is that you'll, no you'll notice that, the, um, that if a task is kind of blocked and, or hung, if you look at the, the stack, um, in many cases, it will show that it's waiting on a, on a Futex. Um, so it's definitely something you interact with every day um, on any machine. Now, the problems for, this, for those interactions come when you start using uh, larger and larger machines in multi-core and, and NUMA. Um, now, Futexes are fast just because um, you can just in the uncontended cases, the lock can be acquired or released with a simple um, compare and swap, read write modify uh, operation. Um, so you never really have to go into the kernel to do anything if it's uncontended. You just take the lock with some atomic operation and you're done with it. Um, this is not the case for traditional primitives um, such as system five, IPC, semaphores. Um, even if the, the lock is uncontended, you always have to call some semop operation um, to, to, to do whatever you, you want to do to actually acquire the lock. So Futexes are fast 
because it implements fast paths um, and has a significant advantage over the rest of the alternatives. This is what the, uh, the actual call looks like, the, the interface. Um, there's a pointer to a U address, the user address, which is actually the, the few text. Um, the, few, the second uh, parameter is the few text operation, what you actually want to do with the few text. Um, this can be either wait, waking, um, requeuing. Now, when you're going to, when you call a few text wait operation, for example, um, you're always, you already know what value um, is that at that address in user space. So that val parameter is the expected value that it already has. Um, this is really important because it, when you call into the system call, there's a lot of stuff that goes on before it actually blocks. So in that time, that's the doing reference counting, processing, taking locks, whatnot in, in the kernel, that value in, in user space could very well change. So that value really is for the users not to deadlock themselves um, when creating applications. So it will always verify that the, that value you specified is still, uh, that, that, that address has that content still at that value. Um, the, in the requeuing part, you, you can, for example, use a second few text. Um, requeuing is, is normally to, to avoid uh, thundering herd problems. Um, so you can basically block, ha have, a, ha have a number of uh, tasks blocked on a few text, and you want to requeue it, you wake those up, but instead of trying to acquire that lock when, at the wake up, you just requeue them to another uh, few text. Um, there are mainly two special cases when using few texts. The first is the um, support for priority inheritance. Um, basically, if you, uh, if you have um, priority inversion problems, which is when <coughs> you have two tasks, one task with a lower priority is holding a lock, then another task with a higher priority tries to acquire it, see it's contended in blocks, and in that time, a, th uh, a third thread with medium priority um, preempts the one with lower priority. So you have the scenario where um, a higher priority task is waiting for um, a lower, waiting for the lower priority one to release the lock, but there's no forward progress. So priority inversion basically lets you um, boost the, pri the priority of the task holding the lock to the one, to the highest, to the waiter with the highest priority. Another, um, special case are robust futexes. It's, ma it's mainly very specific to DLIPC in that it um, keeps track of uh, the locks uh, he held in user space um, such that in case it, the application crashes or there's some kind of abnormal exit, um, it can um, clean up after itself and release those locks. Um, without this, you'd really have to reboot the system. And I think, um, package managers in, in Linux used to suffer severely from this problem. Um, if um, APT crashed, um, you'd really have to re reboot to, to have a clean run again. <coughs> um, we've been talking about creating locks and, and all, but the following example, I've, I've shown an example for a lock and unlock operations, um, and this is really uh, to get an idea of a real world um, usage of few texts. Um, in, this, in this lock function, mm, if the lock is uncontended, you'll just do a simple compare and exchange. Um, if it's unlocked, it'll set it to locked and return unlocked. So that fast path really is, is, just, that, is just that. It's the single um, compare and swap. If the, value, if the, if the lock is contended, then it starts, we have to set waiters or um, basically when you, when you take the lock, it's uncontended, you set it to locked. Then if another one comes in, it, sets, it sees it's locked and oh, I have to set it to waiters. And that's when you have to um, call into Futex. You have to say, okay, I've tried it in another compare and exchange. It's not only locked, it has waiters. I'll, I'll add myself to the wait list and um, wait for the, the unlocking task to wake me up and so I can take the lock. Uh, 
uh, this is exactly what the unlock function does. Um, again, in the fast path, if there are no waiters, it'll just replace, um, it'll just exchange the, the lock value to unlocked and be done. Now, if there are waiters, um, then you have to, again, exchange it back to unlocked from the waiter count and then call into the Futex call for the wake up. Um, that actual uh, command, the Futex wake command, can actually wake up one or more tasks. And in this example, I've only set one task, um, again, to avoid things like thundering herd. But um, you can certainly, if you're doing, for example, um, reader writer locks, you can certainly wake up more, re uh, more readers um, to make better use in, into a single call. Um, so those are basically, it in, in, in a nutshell, um, two very specific uses of Futexes that, can, that are um, used to, to implement. In this case, it's a very simple kind of mutex, right? So now going into the actual implementation, you can think of non-Futex locks, I mean, uncontended locks as fast path, and if you ever have to call into Futex, that's the slow path. And normally you'd forget about it, uh, the, the kernel do what it has to do. Um, but when you're developing an application with locks using Futexes instead of like pthreads and, and whatnot um, directly, it is always good to know what happens underneath the hood in, in the kernel with respect to what I'm calling. Um, the, the overall architecture is basically that the, the address is, is used to create a, a, a unique key um, that, that key will hash uh, into a specific bucket. Um, those buckets can be, the, the hash table can be different sizes. Um, but the, for example, when you call into the, the Futex wait, which is really the first operation that will allow the kernel to, to, to know that this address has some Futex associated to it. Otherwise, it has no idea. Um, and this permits, because the, the, the call doesn't return, this permits that the, the Futex waiter will create a, a data structure called a Futex queue. And that queue is allocated on the stack because we're not returning um, until we're woken up. Um, each of these Futex queues represents a single blocked process. So in the case of the hash table, where I was mentioning uh, different sizes, um, you will have different amounts of of um, Futex is hashing into the, sing the same bucket. Um, now, the actual heart of Futex is in the, in the, the wait queues in itself. Um, the queues are priority based. Um, higher priorities are, are always woken up first. Um, otherwise, it's just the first in, first out uh, kind of ordering. Um, now, to actually add yourself to the list or remove yourself to the list. Of course, you need some kind of serialization, particularly if, for example, you, you have uh, different amounts of, uh, lots of collisions, uh, or two or more tasks are trying to um, work on the same futex. So this is basically serialized by a spin lock, um, and that spin lock can have a lot to say when it comes to the, the the performance bottlenecks. Um, in this particular example, you see that on uh, the hash bucket one, you have basically um, two tasks that hash to the same, um, that, that are using, that are blocked on the same futexes or operating on the same futex. And you have the, the task B1, for example, which is totally different on a different futex, but because of the, the, the collision is serialized with the, 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 the futex, um, U address A. So with, with that architecture, it's, it's kind of intuitive to see some, some very specific issues um, when it comes to performance. Um, the first is that the hash table is uh, globally uh, allocated. Therefore, it's really, really bad for NUMA. Um, on smaller systems, you don't really care. But when you get to a four nodes or beyond, you really start caring about the remote accesses. Um, only the, the tasks that are running on the same node will have the local um, accesses and therefore better latency. If you start doing remote accesses, then it really starts to get 
they get nasty. Um, the second one that I've already mentioned is the hash table collisions. Um, the smaller your, your hash table, the more collisions. And if you're working with a lot of futexes or a lot of locks, um, that only makes it worse. Um, finally, the, um, the contention on the, the lock that serializes the hash bucket um, also depends on, obviously, the, the hold times. Um, now, this is not only about performance. Um, it also affects um, determinism for real-time systems. Uh, for example, um, if you have, going back to the collisions problem, uh, if you have a lot of tasks blocked on different futexes um, on the same hash bucket, then not only is you, your system probably going to perform worse, well, not probably, it does perform worse, but it will also um, take away the determinism and, um, and it'll have unbounded latencies because you can't really uh, know or guarantee how many uh, futexes will be, I mean, how many tasks will share the same hash bucket. So when we address these, these, these issues, um, the side effect is also in th that we have better determinism and um, bounded latencies. Um, throughout maybe the past two years, um, there's been a lot of work to, to addressing a lot of these bottlenecks. Um, and I'm going to show you some, some of the specific examples. Um, so before you actually consider the, uh, the, the priority list, the hash table, um, the, the hash bucket lock, uh, you, also, you have to first convert the U address to the key and hash and to get the hash bucket. Now, all that is done without the, the, the spin lock held, obviously, because we don't know what hash bucket we're going to use first. So it's, it's really worth mentioning a little bit on, on the keys and, and how the hashing is, is performed. Um, the, actual, the actual hashing function is just a traditional Jenkins lookup tree algorithm because it, experimentation showed that um, it's the one that best distributes um, the, the, the different values for the, the, the few texts that are blocking or waking. So you, you, you kind of have it fairly distributed, which is what obviously we want. Um, the big differences start in the actual, the, the actual key generations. <coughs> um, Futexes can be described as uh, private, uh, which is in shared uh, address space. Um, but in the share, different threads sharing that address space, or um, the shared futexes, which is uh, when you're using the actual processes instead of threads. <coughs> um, the, the biggest difference is definitely in performance. Um, if, you, if you're using private futexes, you're basically using the same address space, and therefore you can just uh, use the, the, the address um, to generate the key. However, if you're use, having different address spaces, things start getting a lot more complicated. Um, you have to, for example, find the page that, that's backing it or the inode. Um, that involves taking locks, doing referen more reference counting, RCU, although that's the least of the problems. Um, and all these things start becoming really bad for performance um, on larger systems. Um, the first pr uh, optimization we did was really to, um, for shared futexes, was to make the generating the key lockless. This basically means that um, I mentioned you, you have to look up the, the, the backing page, get user pages. And the, the most important one in that step of the, the, the call is the page lock. Um, this is a sleepable lock, therefore it's immediately uh, bad for, for real time since um, you can just get scheduled out and go to sleep and you can't really do anything about it and there's no guarantees as to that won't happen. Um, the performance issues for taking, just taking another lock are obviously um, better not to, not to have it. So by not having to take the page lock, we were able to um, basically recover, I'll, I'll show you the, the performance differences between private and shared futexes in a moment, but 
with that optimization on shared futexes, it was recovered about 30% of the following scenario. Um, in this case, it's an experiment just with the, the amount of hashing that, that can be done um, on a 52 core a machine with two sockets. Um, each thread count operates on uh, basically a thousand futexes. So in the first, uh, up till about, once you start go using more threads than your physical cores available, things start going bad. But if you're not using that, um, you can notice that the, the overhead of the, the hashing is a lot less uh, pr pronounced as the, the, the hashing for the shared futexes. So that means that um, private futexes will obviously hash a lot more in that given time. But as you start getting pathological and adding more and more threads to just the 52 core box, things start going south anyway. Um, after 256 um, threads, the, the, the actual performance goes really bad. And if you start going to 1,024, we're talking about a million, half a million uh, lock operations, which is unheard of. But it's still interesting to see that in the cases that don't actually, aren't actually using that many thread, uh, that many locks, for example, um, on, in, in the four thread case, you can see the, the, the performance differences are a lot less uh, severe. Um, other things that start happening when you, when you use uh, more threads is that the, the hash bucket size, uh, sorry, the hash table size starts to, to, to influence a lot. When you're hashing on, uh, when you're operating on a million locks, um, unless you, you specifically design it so that there are no, um, there are no collisions, you really can't do anything at all at, at that stage. There, there will always be collisions. Um, Therefore, avoiding these collisions is definitely a major plus. And the, of course, the, the perfect hash size will, will have a one-to-one -one ratio uh, buckets to futexes. <coughs> so this hash table started at around 256 threat, um, entries. And it was fine for, for a lot of years, but in the past two or three years, um, when we were working on things like eight, 80 cores, eight sockets, um, it really started to notice. <coughs> um, so based on that, we, uh, inc we made it the, the, the hash table size scale based on the number of CPUs. So each CPU will have 256 uh, entries. So it's, it's a lot better. And for the normal case where you're actually not using millions of, of locks, um, this works quite well. We have very little uh, amounts of collisions on, on real workloads. Um, so throughput obviously increases significantly and it, the, the minimum four case in the four thread uh, count was around 80%, but when we start getting pathological, we also see that the, the performance boosts uh, up to eight times, uh, and it, uh, 800%. And that's really nice and all, but it's not really perhaps the, the most important thing in that you're not using millions of, of locks. And if you are, you, you have another problem, actually. Uh, so a, a more recent, uh, the second problem to the, is, of course, as I mentioned, the NUMA issue, um, remote accesses, and the, the hash table size doesn't really uh, affect that. So to address that, there's been some recent work on uh, per-process hash tables. Um, instead of it being globally allocated and shared, um, each, uh, each process will have its own um, hash table and it will vary in sizes dynamically. Um, if a, a collision is detected, then it will double the size. Um, this is really nice for NUMA, of course, because it makes all your memory accesses uh, rather local. Um, and it also addresses the, 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 the collision issue by um, being smarter than, than a statically allocated uh, option. Um, so here, here's some, some different numbers on 
comparing what we have now, which is a global um, hash table, with per process hash tables of different sizes. Um, and if you, similar to what we had seen on, on the previous uh, graph, when you use lower thread counts, the global hash table really works because you're operating on fewer futexes, therefore you have fewer collisions. Um, but at some point, it starts going really down and it, like you saw when, when you start getting the um, operating on uh, 10,024 threads, it just flatlines, um, which is the pattern that shows the, 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 blue, the blue line. And if you notice that the different hash sizes and, and the colors really don't that they don't compare in performance to, to what we have right now. The only ones that compare in performance, the ones that scale and that don't flatline, are the per uh, process hash tables with um, large numbers of um, buckets. So in, in this case, the, 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 the best one had uh, 2,000 uh, entries. Uh, and that allows that when you're operating on the, the, the pathological cases of 512 and, and beyond, or 128 and beyond, um, you will really avoid those performance pitfalls. But again, this is also very specific to the amount of locks you're using in user space. <coughs> so when you're operating on a Futex, either you're waking up, you're requeuing, you're, um, you're waiting, you always have to operate on that, uh, that priority queue. So with the, what you do with the lock held is basically, will basically depend on the command, but it will always involve the priority list handling in one way or another. That's fine, that's expected. The second, perhaps more performance critical, definitely more performance critical aspect of it is the actual blocking and waking of those threads. Um, and it's really not hard to find pathological contention on the HB lock, not because of collisions, not because of working on, amount, on huge amounts of, of uh, locks, but because large systems, in my experience, what I've seen in the real world, tend to operate on just a handful of futexes. So you have a lot of, of, of CPUs going after three, four, five, ten futexes, and um, that will generate a lot of contention on the lock, not to mention um, uh, cache line ish, cache line bouncing, depending on, on, on the spin lock implementation. Um, but it can get really, really severe. So blocking wise, there's not really much you can do with the Futex wait command. Um, I mean, you have to buy, that's, that's just how, how it goes. But um, looking at the wake ups, you can definitely do something about that. Um, so if, if, you, if you call, the Futex wait and you're passing it to wake up a lot of, uh, of uh, threads that are sleeping on, on that uh, address, then it will wake up every single of those threads with the lock held. Um, that's, that's part of the, 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 the point of having a single call, so you just go into user space once, wake up everyone you have to wake up, and continue on. But as you wake up more and more threads, contention starts to get higher and higher. Um, so the idea, the, the idea for this optimization was to wake up, was to acknowledge the wake up um, while holding the task, add some sort of, of reference count through a, we implemented a thing called lockless wake queues. Um, it's basically a queue of, of tasks with a pending wake up. Um, but the nice thing about that is that we just have to acknowledge that task. So we just have to add it to the queue. That, we do that with a single um, atomic operation and we have to hold reference that task so it doesn't exit underneath us. And that allows us to basically wake, to, to, to do the actual wake up, the call wake up process, which puts the task back on the run queue, takes a series of locks. Um, it's, it's, it's really heavy call. That allows us to do it in, in a batch at the same time, but without holding that spin lock. So forward progress with the other threads that are blocked can continue um, their business. Um, the actual order of the, of the wake ups does not change at all <coughs> because it's the user that basically is calling that order and we just respect whatever the user was, the, the caller was, was passing. Um, 
again, had, uh, I had mentioned when, when, when you call Futex wake and N is, is large, this is particularly nice. <coughs> um, the actual results um, are here in that with increasingly large threads to wake up, um, it's expected to see that the actual latency of that operation is higher and higher. Um, with the batched one, the lockless wake-ups, we can see that we, the, 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 the latency is much more um, similar. It scales nicely with the amount of threads, and it's rather bounded. Um, there are at least um, two cases that um, this is shown to, to, actual, to actually help uh, things like even soft lockups. I had mentioned um, the spin lock implementation and things regarding uh, like the use of the cache line. Um, I had also mentioned that the contention can be rather pathological in real workloads. This is one example. Um, I haven't put the, the process name or anything, but spending your time waiting um, to acquire a sp spin lock is 60% of the time doing that. Um, that can't be good. And if you have a lock implementation that um, is basically polling on that lock. Um, it will do um, really, really bad things for, uh, for, for, for the cache line. Um, so this is what ticket spin locks used to do, or, or do, actually. Um, but with a replacement called queued spin locks, this is currently only for x86 because other architectures, we're, we're, we're adding um, semantics for, for different uh, barriers that are needed to, to fully implement this. Um, but right now, it's, it's just 86. And instead of spinning or busy waiting on a remote lock, you basically see that the lock is contended, uh, add yourself to the, the, it's a per CPU queue, and just pull on that address instead of the, the, the remote one, um, rather than the lock itself. So when you're going to take and you do this until you're the head of the queue. So it means that you're next in line to acquire the lock. And only then do you go and actually pull on the lock um, variable. This eliminates, like, like I said, a lot of the, um, the inner socket traffic. Um, pre previous, previous experiments have shown that um, this, can, this can help um, systems with four sockets or beyond by uh, up to 800%. And it's not only about performance. It's also about um, things like actual bugs, lockups, that basically one thread will not do forward progress, will not be able to acquire the lock ever. Um, so you'll have splats that, that show that. And um, so when, when you're talking about 80 cores, then maybe it's a performance problem. When you're talking about 240 cores, it's actually a, a bug problem. It's a functional problem. But locks being really, really heavily contended is not always the case. There are cases where the locks um, aren't contended, so you can basically uh, measure the, 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 the new cute spin locks with the unlocking, um, the unlocking overhead. Um, in the case of the ticket spin locks, it used to, well, it unlocks a lock with a, a compare and exchange. Um, in the case of the queued spin locks, it does it with a simple store. So you can see the, 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 the time to measure, I think I did it for 10,000 lock and unlock pairs, and the average was almost 50% um, uh, less overhead, less time to take to, to, to do the unlock. So not only do bigger systems benefit from better cache line usage, but smaller systems will also benefit um, the, in the, the actual unlocking. And, but not that it actually matters for the, the uncontended case, because we're probably not suffering from performance anyway. But it's nice to see that it, not all the performance optimizations um, have been done thinking in large, uh, large uh, systems that are have uh, pathological workloads doing terrible things to it. We can also see the, the benefits in uncontended cases on small machines. <coughs>
um, basically all that I've talked about before, the, the performance optimizations um, are for the general architecture of futexes. Um, the, the, the two special cases I mentioned, the, the PI futex and the robust futex, um, those are kind of parentheses, but particularly for PI futexes, there are some things we can, we can do to improve performance. Um, there's basically, on a PI aware futex, um, there's a, a structure called the PI state, which is attached to the, the futex queue, which is the data structure that represents the block task. Um, in that PI state, you have um, an, a real-time mutex, which, which is actually the way you express the, the priority inheritance semantics through that um, RT mutex. And it's a general purpose lock. It's only that uh, PI futexes include it for um, uh, RT reasons. Um, the, there were two optimizations done, done to this lock. Uh, the first one was the same as the uh, lockless wake-ups, only in this case it's not as important in that we only wake up one task. Um, but you can also, we've also applied um, different ways to avoid blocking. Um, and the top, the top waiter is always the one that's gonna be woken up, that's why there's only one. Um, and the top waiter is the one that has the highest priority, which is, it needs to be the next in line to take the lock. Um, normally, you, w when this occurs, the, even if you're the top waiter, you will block immediately um, and just wait for, for um, someone to, to, to unlock and, and wake you up. Um, but if the current lock owner is running, um, there's a fair chance, and th there's a fair chance that it will release the lock soon. Therefore, we can just spin a little bit and see if the, uh, until the lock owner either changes or releases the lock, and if that's the case, then we, we avoided the blocking overhead. We never slept, although for the user, we might as well have done it, and we avoid all those uh, extra cycles. <coughs> this has shown some um, nice, performance boosts on uh, lower thread counts uh, for a workload that actually exercises uh, priority inversion. Um, it, each, each thread count group, uh, groups three threads with uh, low, high, and, and medium priorities and tries to, to, to bug out the program um, with, a, with, with inversions. So if we measure the amount of inversions done in a period of time, we'll see that with the, the top weight optimizations, it's not always the case with fantastic performance benefits, but on a, on a two socket box, 32 cores, um, you can see there's, there's a slight, um, we do slightly more inversions than we, we do without those um, performance benefits. But it's not only seen in, in, raw, in raw throughput. You also notice that the, the amount of, of system time can go down. You'll notice that the, the, the amount of, um, Cycles will go down. The amount, not not cycles, the uh, cycles per instruction rate will go down. So, well, perhaps not for this case showing a huge benefit because it's it's only one way to where we're, we're optimizing. Um, in the long run, it does affect the system uh, in other ways that um, can actually give you better performance depending on on the application. So we've, we basically, if I go back, oh. trying to get the, the architecture thing again. Okay, so if you look at that architecture in, in the kernel, unless Futex implementation is rewritten, there really aren't any, there's really not much, I mean, I never say never, but on the horizon by today, which we're basically still discussing the, the, the per process hash table, everything in the kernel 
has been addressed performance-wise. Um, so there's really not, not much left to look into when using Futexes, but to actually use them in, in the right way. Um, going back to the, this is terribly slow. So if you still have that, that diagram in, in your head, um, you can actually start immediately tuning your application to actually want to avoid collisions, uh, make use of new locality. Um, but you have to really understand and study your application because um, as with any system called this, the kernel will do whatever you tell it to do. Um, it just obliges. And um, as previous uh, experiments have shown, um, locking algorithms play a huge part um, in the overall performance of a system. Um, and if you're, you're scaling, or if you design a, uh, an application for um, two sockets or eight, eight cores, it's very different. If you put that same application, it'll perform very differently on a larger machine. Um, for example, other things we, we've seen is applications that scale rather nicely on two sockets, still scale rather nicely on four sockets, but on eight sockets, it just goes down. So being aware of the application and when it's, what kind of hardware it's going to run on is very, very important. Um, Lux in, in kernel space and in user space are, are, are rather exposed to the same uh, architectural pitfalls um, on larger machines such as cache line contention and, and NUMA awareness. This is not new. I mean, it doesn't go only for locks. I skip that uh, in the kernel you also suffer from these things and um, we've been tuning our locks a, a lot. Um, well, maybe not so much for the, the NUMA awareness bit, but um, for the cache line contention bits. Um, like I mentioned, scaling based on the number of CPUs is likely to introduce a lot of uh, lock contention uh, and bad for cache line business as well. Um, tools to get the necessary information to make decisions um, are also very similar to the ones we use in the kernel. They're not similar, the same ones. You can use perf, you can use tracing, um, you can use, um, actually perf now does tracing, um, but it's just knowing what to look for knowing your hardware and knowing what your application is doing that, with that. And knowing if you're going to go into the slow lock, and this is the lock of the slow path, you have to know what's going to happen in the kernel. So some best practices um, before I, I, I finish. Some, some best practices for, for building locks is in, in user spaces. The first is data partitioning. Um, if you have a big system, um, you can basically partition it um, with the, the amount of, of NUMA uh, sockets you have and therefore maintain locality. <coughs> uh, lock granularity is obviously important in that um, if you lock too much, you'll be missing out on uh, opportunities for um, parallelization. But it, if you fine grain it too much, you might be um, ab abusing the, the granularity and um, not only will you end up taking more locks and all, but you also reduce system performance on uh, bigger machines. Um, the data layout, avoiding um, uh, false sharing is also very important. Um, if you have a, if you have multiple futexes that um, hash into the adjacent buckets um, and you're doing different operation on these, you're, you're, actually, you're obviously changing them, then you'll obviously have a lot of cache line bouncing going on. So looking at, at um, L, L1 misses, um, TLB misses, any, any kind of things that will show you your use of the machine or not is also obviously important. Um, actually not calling Futex at all, that's the best way to go. Um, 
like, like I, in, in the first example, I could have easily called Futex right away when I saw that the lock was, was uh, not, un, that it was not available. Um, but by introducing the, the waiter, um, the, the, the notion of waiter, you can actually detect if the lock is just contended and there's one, there's just the owner and that's it. Um, and if that's the case, you don't necessarily have to, to, to block. Um, but if there are waiters, then hmm, maybe it's probably better to block. Um, so seeing the different patterns based on what the kernel does with the, the actual calls is definitely, definitely a good idea. Um, some references, I, I put the, the, the Futex man page at first because um, while I guess gave some, some very basic overview of the, the commands, um, this man page was recently rewritten entirely and it's, it went from total crap to actually something you can really use and learn from. And I, I, I mean, every time I, I, I use, I, I'm hacking on Futexes, I'm now starting to, to open that page because instead of having to always tediously look into the code, which I had to do before, because the man page didn't really describe anything, um, now you can just uh, read the man page and more often than not, it'll be, it'll be correct. Of course, looking at the code is, is obviously um, the best way to go. Um, some, some other uh, traditional um, references. Um, the first is the Futex overview and update that talks a lot about different performance work going on in the kernel. Um, all these Futexes are tricky is pretty much uh, uh, obligatory if you're, if you're doing uh, user space stuff. Um, PI requeuing, um, ellipse conditional variables that talks a lot in, in another document. Um, and finally, uh, when, when I was mentioning that the experiments, the previous experiments had shown um, the, the, the performance factors of larger machines versus smaller machines in the same workload, um, you can see all the graphs and, and the numbers there. Um, so with that, thank you. Any questions? Hey, how's it going? It's Milos. Uh, are we ever going to get 64-bit few Texas? You have to uh, convince Linus about that. Uh, the reason is maybe, but not yet because with 32 bits, you have more than enough for any kind of crazy, <laughs> wacky contention. That's, that's why he doesn't want to. When Adam, um, they would also be tricky in for, for 32-bit uh, architectures in that um, updating would perhaps not be uh, at atomic um, right. when you're using uh, this 32-bit uh, platform for 64-bit Futexes. But th the main reason is there's no need for them. Uh, I would argue that there is. Okay. Um, mostly because, I mean, you can do simple locks where you just have a number of waiters or whatever the case is. But there's also complicated synchronization where you want to have a sequence number, a number of waiters, and some other state, and you just can't pack that into 32 bits. Right, but for those cases, you, you can um, use different, um, different Futexes. Um, for example, glibc will, uh, will migrate from one Futex to another based on the amounts of uh, uh, data it's, it's, it's holding and how many uh, paths are blocked. Okay. But, yeah, I mean, you, you can always requeue. Oh, that's true. You can do compare requeue. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly, compare requeue. But, yeah. but it's, uh, that, that is also super crazy. It is. Um, the actual, the, the diagram I'd shown of the, the architecture, it's really, really simple. <laughs> Futexes are so nasty because of the corner cases, like you're mentioning, with the, the comparing and requeuing, particularly with um, priority inheritance based uh, aware of Futexes. All right, thank you. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Gary Duzan, um, uh, could you speak just briefly um, for someone who's looking to do a bunch of synchronization of say tens of thousands of processes, whether you would suggest taking an approach 
you're looking at the, the food taxes directly or say the P-thread um, abstractions on top? If you have a very ad hoc workload, then in my experience, I'm not a user space developer, but from what I've seen, be, uh, people applying few taxes, they apply them, they, they make use of them directly because they want total control over the primitive. And while P threads certainly do a good job, there are corner cases that, um, that will not satisfy everyone. More questions? All right, thank you.